Okay, uh, so uh, welcome to uh, EC5390 and MSC cross-listed as MSC5472. So this is a class on uh, um, quantum transport of electrons in uh, electronic as well as photonic devices and also in quite a few uh, novel, uh, new and emerging materials. Uh, and uh, this course is, uh, I think you're probably the first uh, um, you know, um, cl class this semester for my many of, for some of you at least. And uh, we are going to meet uh, Tuesdays and Thursdays. Uh, I'll go through some of the details of the class uh, and uh, contents and uh, um, you know, expectations, etc. But before I get going, um, uh, I wanted to just explain a little bit about uh, what are the, uh, uh, you know, sort of the background and uh, why are we, um, uh, you know, uh, why was this course put together in the first place? You know, so, um, so uh, I would like to say that, uh, y you know, in, in uh, I personally, in my own research group, I do research on semiconductor-based materials. And, uh, uh, and we understanding the way uh, uh, electrons and uh, charge, uh, heat or spin uh, move uh, in these materials and uh, uh, enables us to control them, uh, to control their uh, properties, uh, make them uh, do rather amazing things, uh, make them uh, do computation, uh, try, uh, do thinking for us, you know, try to do uh, immense amounts of computation calculations for us uh, forces uh, we can teach them how to recognize images by looking at pictures right uh, and uh, uh, when the electrons talk to light or photons uh, they can uh, be used as detectors that's what is your uh, cell phone cameras right uh, we can we can uh, make them remember things for us right and that's memory uh, so uh, immense amounts of, uh, I think, terabyte memories are on. You know, you can carry them around with you now, right? So that, uh, uh, so uh, today's uh, at least the information age. A lot of it uh, owes its uh, origins to understanding the transport of electrons uh, and um, be it communication, uh, computation. Uh, logic, memory, all that kind of things. So that's kind of a uh, kind of an engineering motivation for uh, for this course. Uh, there's also a very more kind of fundamental and basic uh, motivation for this course. Uh, uh, some of the deepest uh, laws of nature today uh, in physics, uh, are, uh, and, and that, that are uncovered by physics. Uh, are uh, have come about by trying to understand electrons. Um, the discovery of, uh, uh, you know, the development of, uh, of, of uh, the quantum mechanics, quantum field theory, um, all have come about when trying to understand what is an electron. And the amazing thing is we are still trying to understand it. You know, it's not like it's over. You know, um, and um, so uh, I think the electron was discovered. Uh, slightly over a hundred years ago uh, before that people didn't know did not even know that there's something called an electron right? so uh, and uh, since then it has really made us understand how uh, how light is created you know how particles behave in the smallest scale uh, the, the 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 push to understand the electron uh, led to the uh, electron and its interaction with light you know how do you create light by um, you know, oscillating electrons, for example, led to uh, the development of quantum mechanics, to uh, uh, and 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 quite a few uh, you know um, developments that have come about, and some of them we'll touch, you know, we'll discuss in some depth in this course as well, have come about by trying to understand, uh, be it electrons moving in free space or inside a crystal, inside a metal, a semiconductor, a superconductor. Uh, more recently, a lot of very interesting. Uh, concepts that were initially just, uh, you know, uh, seem to be mathematical, uh, have uh, shown up in semiconductor materials or in uh, crystals or called topological insulators. Uh, and there are many faces of the electrons that are coming about by looking at these things. So, just kind of both from uh, 
from an application perspective as well as from a more deep-rooted you know, human endeavor of uh, trying to figure out things, right? From both aspects, uh, uh, I, I think the course, the way it's put together, we try to merge the two aspects of it. You know? So, so we, we do the uh, uh, fundamental science, but also highlight where today and potentially in the next few decades, uh, some of these uh, will lead to applications, and some of the o applications that we already understand, we will cover them as well. Right? So, in general, I would say that the course is somewhat broad in that sense, but the core concepts are not that broad. We, the core concepts, uh, we will you know, uh, dive into it uh, in this course and try to understand the core concept, and then um, look at a few examples uh, of it, and then move to the next concept of, you know, trying to understand many phases of electron in, in electrons in, 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 in solids. Okay? So in solids or in vacuum or in such. So that's a very general overarching theme of uh, what this course is uh, meant to do. So uh, before I get going, I wanted to hand out uh, something that you can actually download um, from the, from the uh, course description, but still I think it's good to have a copy of it. Um, so, I don't know how many of you are here, but uh, I'll just, uh, and some of this, we can pass it around. <coughs> pass them around. So, uh, yeah, just uh, course contents and uh, uh, these things I think I should probably go in that. I'll keep one for myself. <laughs> yeah, no problem, no problem. Yeah, take your time, give a minute. So, <clears throat> so uh, you don't have to read this. This is essentially uh, the handout I uh, just passed around. Did everybody get it? Oh, some of you didn't. Are there any extras? Okay, I'll just. All right, so um, so we are meeting uh, every uh, Tuesday and Thursday in the mornings, uh, 840 to 955 in this room. Um, so I think the, probably one of the toughest things about the course would be to wake up and make it here at 840. Uh, so, but I would say that the classes, attending the classes would be very important for you. Uh, and in fact, uh, um, you know, typically the discussions that happen uh, during or after the classes are extremely valuable. Uh, so try to make it to as many uh, or most of the classes. Uh, you know, some of it may be unavoidable, but uh, please do try to make it. Uh, as you saw, uh, the lectures are going to be recorded. Uh, the uh, recorded lectures are not going to be available till uh, maybe a midterm exam, as I'll describe later, or the finals. So, uh, so I would, you know, kind of like to say in the beginning uh, that uh, um, do not not come to class thinking that the videos are available anyway, right? So that's not what the purpose for these recordings are. You know, uh, uh, it's for you to review perhaps later and to uh, make uh, these courses accessible to. Uh, students uh, around the world, uh, many parts of the world, so the departments here are taking an initiative to make the uh, course materials available to beyond this classroom later on, not, not, not during the course. Okay? So, so uh, please uh, uh, do uh, make it to the lectures. Now that being said, uh, I do have some uh, requirement for travel, meaning I m maybe about four of the classes I uh, Tuesdays or Thursdays that I, I might miss, uh, in which case I would like to make up the classes uh, and I will poll all of you, those who are registered in the class, for, uh, to give me a, a, sh you know, a slot, time slot uh, in the week that we keep as a backup in case we need extra classes uh, because of travel related uh, you know, uh, um, classes that I might miss. So I'll, I'll uh, poll you on that, okay? so out of, outside of class by emails. Uh, but uh, in general, uh, 
except for these uh, a few uh, classes, um, we'll meet on Tuesdays and Thursdays at this time. Okay, so. <coughs> All right, so uh, course frequency, that's, uh, it's actually offered every second fall, not spring. Uh, I don't know how it got typed, uh, so this is clearly fall semester. And the uh, prereqs, so this is kind of an important uh, uh, aspect of the course. Uh, we, we are going to, um, uh, so the typical prereqs for this course are that you have had uh, some form of a solid state physics or a condensed matter physics or something of that sort, a course on that. So meaning you have seen uh, the application, uh, even at an introductory level application of uh, uh, you know, uh, the quantum mechanics for solids, uh, how uh, you know, block theorem, band gaps, things like that, effective mass. Now, uh, if you had it long time ago and you want to refresh it, there will be opportunities in this class. But you have, if you have never seen any of that, I would really uh, uh, request you to come talk to me uh, and, and see whether you know, uh, that has to be discussed and uh, you know, finalized on a case-to-case -case basis. Uh, so, uh, because uh, I will make some assumptions that you know such and such things and, and uh, I don't want you to you know, uh, not uh, have that uh, uh, layer of understanding underneath because uh, if not then you know, some of the things you learn later may not quite make sense. So, so please discuss those, th that with me. Uh, and similarly, uh, quantum mechanics, uh, if you had an introductory course, it will be of great help. Uh, and uh, if you have had quantum, you know, as part of another course, uh, uh, again, uh, if you haven't had a separate quantum course, I would encourage you to talk to me as well, because I'll also make some assumptions. I'm not going to make assumptions, uh, I, I will, uh, meaning, uh, I'm not going to make assumptions that you know everything about it, of course, but uh, at least some exposure to it is es essential and necessary for this course. You know? so, so that's something I want to kind of get going with. And uh, I, I, I think uh, all uh, science and engineering students typically have had uh, you know, exposure to electromagnetic theory uh, and uh, some amount of classical mechanics, you know, Newton's laws and such. So those will be, uh, uh, those will be those are understood that you, I, I, I take it for granted that you have seen some of that. And whatever we need, we will you know, obviously open the box there and start looking at it carefully again. You know, so yeah. uh, so uh, to summarize the prereqs, if you feel that uh, you have not had uh, a class on solid state physics or quantum mechanics, uh, please uh, talk to me after, after uh, the class today or you know, sometime uh, in the week, uh, uh, this week or the next, okay? Okay, so uh, some of you may be taking 4570, which is electronic devices, ECE 4570 on solid state devices. So uh, uh, I think uh, this course will definitely help a lot in that class. Uh, this course is not specifically on devices, though we will look at transport in some of the devices, but it's not specific. This course is not specifically on devices. So. Um, uh, I would say that uh, do not take this class as a device class. No. So if you need to take, understand transistors or diodes, uh, this is not the class you should be in. Though we will talk about it, uh, we won't go into, it too, into too much depth because we were more interested in the transport aspect of the story. Okay? Um, textbooks and related materials. I, 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 there is no single textbook for it uh, for this class, but I will hand out uh, and I will uh, hand out uh, uh, notes either uh, that uh, uh, I might have prepared or uh, chapters from books uh, that are relevant for the courses as uh, course material as we go along. So uh, it's, it's, it's a graduate level course, but as an advanced undergrad, you should have no problems with it. I mean, we, uh, as the course progresses, uh, there will be, uh, and I'll describe it uh, briefly, it's good to have all the expectations uh, you know, cleared up in the beginning. So, um, uh, there are no recitations and no labs for this course. And uh, uh, the, um, all the uh, materials that you would, I would expect you to read will appear on a class website and I'll send you a link to the class website uh, uh, perhaps uh, uh, before the next class on, on Thursday. I'll send you a link which will have PDFs and you can download. It will have the class calendar. Uh, lectures, you know, what contents will be covered in which lecture and so on. So uh, you can get those, okay. So assignments, exams, and projects. So, uh, so
so assignments are a very important part of this course. Um, and uh, uh, there will be typically about five homework assignments in this course. Uh, uh, and uh, could be two weeks or three weeks, depending upon the times. Times And uh, uh, the, you are encouraged to work with each other. Uh, I don't uh, you know, restrict you to just do all the stuff by yourself. In fact, uh, I would encourage you to uh, form small teams or, or talk to each other when you solve the assignment problems. Uh, but when you turn them in, uh, please make sure that it's completely your work, meaning you have written it, you have made the plots. Do not turn in. You know, if you have worked with somebody, please do not turn in the same plots because that's telling me that you, somebody didn't put in the effort there, you know, to just make a plot by themselves. So uh, you're encouraged to work with each other, but turn in something that is completely distinct from somebody else's. You know? So, so uh, you know, your own uh, solutions and your own uh, uh, plots and figures. Uh, so uh, just to uh, also, you know, the aspect of it is uh, you can read the last part which is the academic integrity uh, if you do that then unfortunately it's considered as uh, you know uh, uh, as as cheating or copying so that's not allowed you know it's a, it's, it's a violation of academic integrity not to be not to turn in your own work you know so please uh, make sure that you do that uh, and uh, uh, so the homeworks will be you know, you have typically about five homeworks through the semester. It's not that many, uh, but I would say that some of the uh, problems may need a little more effort. It's mainly forced to emphasize what we were t covering in the class. Sometimes we even go beyond what we might cover in the class. So, you know, that's a way to uh, learn that aspect. So there will be one take-home written exam at the middle of the semester. Uh, only one exam written uh, in the middle of the semester, uh, and it's a take-home written exam. Uh, and uh, uh, the finals will actually be projects. The, it, it won't be a written exam, but it will be a project. So you will choose a research topic on quantum transport uh, uh, in discussion with me. Uh, you may form, maybe uh, depending upon the size of the class, uh, it could be individual projects or you could choose uh, to have a t small team uh, uh, of uh, two or three uh, students. And you choose a topic, and the purpose of uh, so, and and the expectation is, uh, uh, in the end of the semester, you uh, have a you, you hand in a project a report, which is written in the form of a scientific paper, a journal paper, and uh, uh, you present it to the whole class. You present that topic to the whole class. You can divide up the topic between if you are in a team. You can, we can divide it up. And we can discuss those details later, but it will be like a mini, uh, uh, you know, symposium of about, say, eight or ten talks of different topics, aspect aspects of this uh, of this subject of quantum transport, and all of those topics will go beyond what we do in the classroom. So, so that's meant to uh, look at uh, the research frontiers in this area. And so, you know, my goal is to start from the basics uh, in this course and take you to a point where you can look at what's happening what's the latest uh, in the in the field today you know where, where are things today and what are the most difficult questions people are addressing and uh, uh, at least be aware of it and what techniques that we learn in the course are going to help you to understand them and, and address them so so uh, so for that research project uh, the way we do it is uh, uh, there are two you know there's one uh, there is a first draft version of it of the report and a first short presentation and then a full blown presentation a full report in the end so that's how we're going to do so that's your final exam uh, and uh, you can see uh, uh, so this is a graduate course and I expect uh, um, you know that uh, you put in the effort by yourself and I don't have to enforce all kinds of weird rules uh, but uh, uh, so uh, but I do have to assign a grade at the end of the course. And so I have a certain distribution listed here. A large part of it is in homeworks, uh, a certain you know, 10 percent in the written take home exam and 20 percent in the final research project. So that's the distribution. So you can see relative weights of things here and you can work with that. OK, so uh, now, uh, so I went through these details. Uh, any questions before we kind of get started with technical aspects? Anything that is in your mind that I didn't talk about? <coughs> yeah, Andrew? Do you have office hours? Good question. So uh, office hours, uh, I will 
um, I have to poll everybody, and I will do that. So uh, let me take, make a note of that. Uh, so yes, I will have uh, office hours for this course. And uh, so I'll, I'll poll all of you. Uh, and I'll also, in the same email, poll you for the hours for the extra class, which may be the same time. You know? So we, we'll see if, if, I, if you find a time slot when everybody, or you know, those who are planning to take the course are available, we can do that. So, yep. So That's a good question. So um, uh, I personally do not have a, 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 you know preference. If you feel strongly that you want to be uh, do an individual project, then we can do that. If you uh, feel comfortable uh, having. So typically, what happens is uh, if there are 30 projects, it becomes a little unwieldy. So I might suggest if the projects are similar, uh, I might suggest you to talk to somebody and see if you can work together on a certain topic, but you will be doing your own thing, meaning you will be looking at some aspect which will be a true collaboration. Everybody has to pull their own weight. You know, you can't just say, oh, I'm part of a team and I'm not going to do anything. So when we'll make sure of that. So, yeah. Any other questions? All right. All right. So, uh, Okay, so uh, so today uh, what I wanted to do was uh, um, so we, we'll just briefly look at uh, some of the course topics and then uh, get started with some of the uh, fundamentals. Uh, actually, I'll give, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about some motivation as well. So the course is kind of roughly divided into four parts. Uh, uh, the first is uh, we're going to review uh, the fundamental concepts that are going to be absolutely critical for everything to, to follow. And, uh, um, and, and then the, in, in, in the fundamental core concepts, uh, we will be uh, understanding transport of classical particles and then uh, understand that under many situations, electron transport can be understood completely from a classical perspective. You don't even have to invoke quantum mechanics. But then there's a whole range of other things where you need to invoke quantum and, and then we'll identify those situations and then, then uh, you know, move forward. Uh, we'll set up the rules uh, for understanding transport uh, in, in uh, uh, semi-classical systems like drift, diffusion, mobility, recombination, etc. And then uh, look at uh, the quantum versions of all of these. And then uh, uh, a, a chunk of this uh, second part is related to single particle transport, where electrons uh, move and uh, you know, their transport phenomena uh, of an electron seems like it's completely independent of all the other electrons that are around it. You know, so there's a single particle transport. Uh, uh, and then uh, we will get into uh, some of the new and emerging concepts uh, of how geometry of uh, uh, band structure of space and time and other things uh, enter into some transport phenomena uh, that are kind of emerging now in, in the last two or three decades uh, have uh, many physical phenomena in transport that were considered to be anomalous some time ago, like the anomalous Hall effect, etc. Now we have a much clearer understanding in the last couple of decades as to why uh, uh, electrons behave in a certain manner in their transport uh, and they have got to do with some uh, new ideas of geometrical and topological physics. So we'll cover that and uh, uh, that would still be single particle physics. And then finally, the last topic, uh, when I say, and the, one of the topics would be many particle or correlated transport where you cannot explain the current flowing through a solid by considering it as a single electron when all electrons act as one object, you know, so it's one solid object and that's superconductivity and correlated physics and uh, uh, so that will be uh, many particle aspect is where we'll end it. You know, so. Now, it's listed in this nice way, but uh, I may not follow an exact tra trajectory like this, you know, I, that we'll see as we progress, meaning I may, it looks like we're going to do a lot of single particle physics, I may, may spend a little less time here a lot more time here, for example. Uh, I had taught this class in 2015 and this year, uh, and 
most of the contents of the class uh, from that year are available online. You know, lecture notes, assignments, videos uh, of the lectures are available online. This time I wanted to emphasize a bit more on these two aspects. Uh, uh, and uh, not like I'm not going to discuss these, I will definitely cover these, but because uh, I might ask you to, uh, um, to make use of some of the available material to co cover some topics here. And I might spend a little more lecture hours on, on, on these new and emerging topics. As well. okay. But in general, I cover all, all, all these topics in, in, in reasonable uh, depth. It's just the emphasis may be a little different from the last time it was taught. So, uh, OK. <clears throat> so uh, I just wanted to uh, get going by, uh, from an application perspective, I mentioned that many of these things are incredibly useful. Uh, so here's, here's, for example, uh, a semiconductor-based uh, transistor that is uh, uh, used today in uh, all uh, cell phones, laptops, and everything like that. Uh, if you look at these semiconductor, th this part is the semiconductor. This is a dielectric material uh, uh, th that's dielectric, and on top of it, you have a metal. You know, so we have metal, metal insulator and semiconductor so, it's a, so metal insulator and semiconductor and uh, if you look at the dimensions of this uh, semiconductor you know fin this 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 little thing is called a fin so you're looking at a cross section of it uh, uh, so the dimensions are actually pretty amazing you can look at uh, in the individual atoms here right uh, and and the top of it is about four nanometers across so you can count how many atoms there are and it's a fin that, you know, these are all individual atoms. And uh, around it is an insulator semiconductor, and then there's a metal around it here. So it's a metal insulator semiconductor. And uh, uh, each of these, tra th this is uh, an tra a transistor structure. So if I apply a voltage on the metal here, let's say I apply a positive voltage on the metal here, uh, it will create electric field lines that will kind of penetrate into the, and reach the semiconductor through the insulator. And it will create uh, 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 electrons. Uh, electrons will accumulate around these edges of this. You know, so. so there will be an electron gas, if you might, that will form around here. And you know, out of the plane here and on the other side, there are two electrodes. And if you apply the voltage, it becomes conductive. So the transistor switches on. So you, you form the channel, electron channel, that connects what you call as a source and a drain. And we'll talk about all these things later or in detail. Uh, and then we release the gate voltage, and those electrons are gone, and suddenly there's no more current. You know, so so because it's insulated now, so you are transforming this semiconductor chunk from an insulating state when there are no electrons to a state where it's highly conductive, almost like a metal. It's not quite a metal, so it's undergoing every time you switch it from off, in which case this is an insulator, to on when it becomes a highly good conductor. Every time it's going through an effectively a metal insulator, metal insulator transition. And that happens at uh, uh, about 0.1 picosecond, you know, 10 to the minus 13 seconds. That's very, very fast. You know? So, so it's a, this is a question. Yeah. Is that STR? How's that picture taken? Yeah, that's right. So uh, this picture is taken, it's, uh, you're right, this is a scanning tunneling microscope. It's actually very interesting because the imaging is also done with electrons. You know? So what you do is you take this uh, chunk of Let's actually look through the whole whole detail. So, uh, here's how the microprocessor looks today. Uh, it's a 14 nanometer microprocessor. All these things you see are metal lines that are designed over seven levels or eight levels, depends, to connect a transistor that is down here. And that transistor is down here. It's not visible in this picture you know, because these are microns and that is nanometers, so you can't see it. Right? So, then uh, you slice through it. And all these seven levels are to reach a billion of these transistors. It's right? so a billion of them, billion of them. And to reach each of them, you can imagine the, the circuitry would be very complex, right? So you have these are interconnect levels of metals. And then, you know, for example, you go in here, here, and then maybe somewhere down there, and you can reach one of those one billion. You know? And each of them can switch between ones and zeros. So. Now, uh, I, I'll come to uh, the question here. And then you zoom in here. Uh, so the way the samples are prepared is you slice through this whole thing. And then uh, you form a very thin wedge of it. And then you put the wedge. Uh, and then you have an electron beam go through it now. Electron beam goes through it. And now this is a periodic uh, set of points. And the electron 
as you know, or as we will discuss in great detail in this course, is a wave. An electron is both a particle and a wave, right? So it will diffract of this, and you look at the diffraction spot, and from that you can recover what is the image. So it's a, it's a tunneling, uh, sorry, not a, 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 a transmission electron microscope image where the electrons are transmitting through this diffraction grating, and you know, it's, it's the. TEM. It is TEM. STEM. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, yeah. STEM. And you're scanning, right? So yeah, it's, it's a STEM image, so yeah. yeah. You had a question? No, that was, yeah. I just want to clarify what you meant. Tunnel it's a STEM. Yeah, yeah, it's a, a scanning, tra tra uh, transmission electron microscope, not tunneling. It's not tunneling. Yeah. So, okay, so that's that's the uh, so you are controlling electron transport, but then you are also using electron transport to image this structure at the same time. You know, effectively, if you look at it, yeah. So electron transport is extremely essential also for imaging and metrology and things like that. Uh, so that's uh, that's essentially uh, uh, the prototype silicon transistor today, and uh, the dimensions are down to about you know tens of nanometers or even less almost now, uh, from source to drain, and you can see the structure in this picture. So uh, as people started making transistors in you know, 60s and 70s, uh, uh, what has happened is. Uh, a few new concepts or new phenomena emerged in these devices that uh, uh, people had not anticipated before. Uh, one of the very good examples is in a transistor, uh, uh, what was discovered is what's called the quantum Hall effect. And quantum Hall effect uh, is uh, where, uh, we will discuss this in, in reasonable detail later, but quantum Hall effect is a phenomena where uh, the resistance becomes, or conductance becomes quantized to an incredible precision uh, in steps. You know, the resistance of a semiconductor uh, crystal uh, goes through very precise steps of which are ratios of fundamental constants like Planck constant and electron charge. And uh, that was rather remarkable. And then, uh, you know, that was discovered in 1980, uh, and then uh, it has led to. Uh, this whole field of topological physics and, and aspects of this that, that came out of a silicon transistor which is kind of interesting and uh, when people are measuring this uh, they discovered that unex quite unexpectedly the resistance was uh, quantized and we will talk about that uh, in this course as well as a motivator for some of the topological physics uh, and uh, you know Berry phase and things like that and uh, these things are both uh, at the same time incredibly you know engineering uh, or rather uh, useful in engineering, but at the same time they're probing uh, aspects of physics. I think there have been probably, I don't know, six or seven Nobel Prizes in that since then, you know, for people who discovered it, then measured it, and then figured out the theory behind it, and all that sort of thing. So, so it's kind of a, a pretty rich subject in that sense. You know? So from a more engineering perspective, uh, uh, I'll uh, probably this is the last slide I wanted to uh, this a uh, couple of more. From an engineering perspective, uh, those of you who are interested in um, making uh, using uh, concepts here for making, uh, say, electronic or photonic or spintronic devices, uh, what, how are we using uh, our knowledge of quantum transport? And I'll come to this again at the end of the course, trying to summarize uh, what all we learned. Uh, I mentioned that, for example, in the transistor itself, we, are, we can switch uh, things at uh, incredibly fast rates, uh, sub-picosecond you know, switching on and off of a transistor. So that's very, very fast. But uh, if you look at uh, so a transistor, and we'll talk about that uh, again in, in, in quite some detail later, so here's a semiconductor channel. What we, this is a circuit diagram of a transistor. We have a voltage applied on the gate and a voltage applied on another contact. The electrons are flowing through this material. And here's a gate. And the gate controls whether you have electrons, we allow electrons to go through or not. Right? So this same transistor is used for logic and for communications. In logic, what we do is that in the gate we feed in ones and zeros. So this is digital logic based on what's called the von Neumann architecture of a computer. Uh, it's a Turing machine and, and uh, you, if, you, if you let current flow, for example, it, you can consider it to be a one. If you don't let it flow, it's a zero, for example. right? You can choose whatever you call as ones and zeros, but uh, based on the gate, you can let it flow here, in which case the resistance here would be 
same as ground. If you stop the current from flowing, then the resistance will be high. So you get high voltage or low voltage, zeros and ones, zeros and ones. So, so that's the basic idea of any digital transistor that can, uh, you know, this is, uh, for example, it, it, this might be considered as an inverter. It, it inverts the signal from zero to one or from one to zero, it's an inverter. Uh, and this is not the best inverter, typically it's a complementary MOS, you have N and a P and so on, but uh, all right, so that's a logic device. In a logic device, what we uh, desire, you can make a logic device, in fact the first tra transistors that were made were for electrons moving through vacuum, in a vacuum tube. And, uh, and in fact you don't even need electrons to make a uh, logic device, you can make them with uh, with uh, mechanical objects, you know. it's just that you know to do logic using, uh, say, you know, brillet balls or something like that. You can make logic devices using them. It's just going to cost you a lot of energy, and it's going to be extremely slow. You know, so so what electrons do is electron to us today is the lightest particle that we know how to control, how we can move around. Right? The lightest particle that we know of today, uh, which has mass. So photons are also you know very light particles but we have a much more difficult time controlling the motion of photons you know whereas electrons are you can do you know you have way more control over it you know and that's kind of the theme of this course as well right? uh, so what electrons do is in a logic device it lets you sorry uh, do this sort of a energy delay energy and delay it it lets you go to the lowest possible you know uh, energy delay product for doing logic of all particles that we know of today. You know. Uh, electrons are also, uh, as you know, they are charged. So uh, like charges will repel, unlike charges attract. And that's not available for photons. You know, two photons cannot repel or attract. You know. so, so they don't even see each other. They're bosons, they just go through each other. If you take two laser beams, they go through each other you know, unaffected. Not so with electron beams, right? They will collide and scatter. So electrons interact very strongly with each other. In fact, uh, uh, you know that that is the, also the reason why they are very very useful for logic operations. You know, because they interact, and you can confine them into small geometries and keep them within three or four nanometers and keep you know control their properties in these small dimensions. That's what lets us do logic at extremely low energies and extremely fast you know, with electrons. Uh, just to emphasize, you don't need electrons for it, but it's really a great help that you have, you know, doing it with the, your, your, uh, you have those available for it. By the way, I think you, is it visible, <laughs> the screen? Yeah. I'll use the board too, but it's, you know, a few slides at this point. Uh, so, uh, but then, you know, it, it would be also wrong to say that this is the best we can do. Uh, uh, perhaps there are ways one can go even uh, lower than what current standards, current best case scenarios are. But regardless, I mean, uh, uh, we, uh, we are actually kind of still quite a, quite a bit far from fundamental quantum mechanical limits at this point. You know? so, so we, uh, a few orders away, and m m much of that has to do not so much with the electron transport inside here, but all these other, you know, interconnects, parasitics, all the energy lost in trying to get the information from here to there. Logic that that's what costs a lot more energy, which is also a transport problem in itself. So, so that's a transistor used for logic, for uh, digital logic, you know, zeros and ones. Uh, and the transistor is used for communications uh, in a slightly different way. In communications, what we do is we uh, are trying to communicate information from one point in space to another, right? And today, uh, pretty much all communication. Uh, in electronic systems, information systems is done at the speed of light, right? Light is the carrier of information from one point to another. But uh, the information is created in electrons. You know, the electrons, uh, you know, this is where the information is created, you know, some zeros and ones or something like that. You check the weather, there's a, maybe a drone inside, a, inside a, uh, you know, doing space exploration or clouds. It gets the information, but that has to be transmitted to, to you know, uh, you have to check the weather on your phone, so it has to come somehow to your phone. And that information transmission is uh, uh, through waves or photons. And the photons are created typically by electrons themselves, you know, in an antenna or in a laser where you take an electron at a high energy and dump it to a low energy and it emits a photon. You know. so, so that's how you create the, you know, the, the, the photons 
Uh, or you have a metal antenna and you slosh the electrons back and forth and it creates the electromagnetic wave that communicates with the cell phone tower or something like that. So electron transport also creates the communication, uh, you know, uh, transmit, uh, it, 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 it creates, uh, it transmits the information and it also receives the information. So a detector today, a photo detector will detect light, uh, uh, you know, or, or uh, for microwaves, uh, the cell phones, for example, I think I, I like this example very much. I, somehow I don't have my cell phone, but the antennas around your cell phones today are basically metals and the electrons are sloshing back and forth when they receive the signal. And then uh, a transistor is used to both transmit and receive these signals. And the way it does it is, is, let's say you're flowing a certain amount of current and an oscillating wave voltage of a wave comes along and it oscillates the output voltage here and you can amplify it. And we'll discuss this also how a transistor is also an amplifier. You know, it can boost a signal from nanovolts to millivolts or something like that and make it uh, you know, available because uh, typically the signals you receive are, are very weak you know, but they're there, you know, I mean, and, and you need to amplify them to boost them to be able to understand, uh, you know, what, what that signal was about. And, and uh, uh, so the transistors are used for that. And in this situation, in this scenario, what we need is uh, to be able to amplify a lot, and that's called gain of a transistor. You know, to be, you know, if, uh, so you want a high gain, and you also want a high speed. So today's communication systems are typically in a few gigahertz today for cell phone towers and all that. And I think uh, as, as time goes on, this will increase. You know, we will be able to download more data. Uh, and so the speed will go up. And so we need transistors that can have high gain at high frequencies. You know? So here you want to go this way. And here you want to go that way. The digital logic and communication systems. It's kind of a general, very general overarching uh, ideas of uh, where electron transport plays a big role. And the speed of these transistors the speed of these transistors, how well you can control them, how much energy, how much delay, how much gain is very much related to the transport problem of electrons inside solids. So, uh, so this is the last slide, at least uh, as far as the motivation goes. So uh, again, uh, I'll post these, uh, so don't have to, if you can't read or see easily, that's okay at this point. So the game that we are going to really play is, uh, we'll start with the, uh, with, uh, uh, electron transport in, in vacuum pretty much and try to understand that well you know, because that's the simplest problem. You know, if, you, if, we, if we don't understand that, it'll be a little hard to see how electrons would move through complicated crystals and all that, right? So we look at that problem from its classical physics perspective and it's also its quantum aspect. And then uh, look at how does the electron move uh, uh, you know, when you have an atom, right? And, and, and that's the basic of quantum mechanics, the hydrogen atom, things like that. How does it move? And then we will put it in a crystal, right? In a periodic crystal, uh, be it uh, silicon or a metal. Uh, the, you know, as you know, the, so the, uh, once we understand how the electrons move, what, is the, what are the physics or physical laws governing their transport? Uh, after that, from from an application perspective as well as a physics perspective, the game is very interesting. So you have a limited number of atoms in the periodic table, right? It's not infinite, right? Individual atoms, uh, elements. But then the combinations are very large, right? You can have compounds and all that sort of thing. Right? You can combine and make uh, uh, sodium chloride or silicon germanium or gallium arsenide and all that, right? So the interesting thing is the transport uh, properties uh, are a lot of them are we can design it from an atomic level today you know we can design that hey I want the electron uh, to uh, you know band structure for example to be exactly like this so I can choose today in you know using first principles DFT sort of first principles quantum mechanical calculations you can design some aspects of it from 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 first principles but not all you know in fact there are quite a bit of uh, a range of phenomena where uh, where, which are called emergent, meaning when you put these materials together, it will behave completely different from what the theory was predicting. You know? And that's very interesting. That's called emergent phenomena because in it lies some new laws of physics that were not discovered, right? Because you could only design something from the laws of physics that were known, right? So for, for the physic, you know, physical laws that were not known, it, you can't predict it right? because you didn't feed it into the computer, right? So uh, for in that sense, so there are two kinds of, uh, so I would consider, for example, 
when uh, say superconductivity was discovered, it was an emergent phenomena, you know, because uh, the uh, at that po point the, the known laws of physics pe people had to discover new laws or, or you know physical laws to understand it to explain superconductivity. Similarly, quantum Hall effect was was uh, 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 also an emergent phenomena at that time, and we are learning now. And and uh, uh, so uh, that's really the uh, game. As an engineer, for example, you also have this finite you know set of atoms but we typically look at a much smaller set like near silicon you know in semiconductors or we'll you know if you're doing superconductivity you'll be looking at a few of these if you're doing topological insulation you're looking at bismuth selenide or something like that right but uh, using that uh, how do we think how do we design something that has the exact transport that you desire is one aspect of the story which is engineering the other aspect of it is experimentally what has been measured and uh, how do we understand it based on the what, you know the physical laws that we know? So that's kind of a very generic, you know, generic theme uh, of of uh, uh, of this course. Okay, so okay, so I'll kind of uh, um, end there, end the basic motivation aspect of the story there, and I'll get started on 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 on, on some topics uh, uh, of the fundamentals. I'll just stop here very briefly. Any more questions? I can take them. Yeah. And please feel free to uh, you know, stop me, ask questions, because uh, that's uh, 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 very important for me to also understand uh, uh, you know, what's bothering you, for example, and, and that, that's an important way to also learn, uh, learn uh, as well. Right? OK, so, so we start with review of fundamentals. And uh, today, I'll, I'll essentially uh, try to summarize uh, the, the classical aspect of transport first and then motivate uh, why do we need quantum mechanics in the first place. And in this course, we will really uh, uh, be very much driven by experimental work, you know, meaning we will start by uh, you know, every new topic that I bring up in this course that we want to discuss will be driven by some experimental you know, observation that uh, uh, unfortunately was not, it was not possible to explain it with, with, with you know, uh, all the known rules of electron transport that we did before, so we have to learn something new now, right? So that's how we're going to motivate the course, you know, as we go along. So um, uh, let's see. So review of fundamentals. Uh, and in fundamentals, uh, I'd like to kind of uh, start with the uh, very basic concepts of uh, classical, you know, mechanics. And, and why am I doing that? That's because, you know, uh, electrons uh, mechanics. Uh, electrons are indeed uh, uh, have mass, right? And uh, uh, because of that, they follow uh, the rules of uh, 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 classical mechanics. I mean, they of course follow the rules of quantum mechanics as well. But classical mechanics is uh, uh, how it ends up, you know, as a limiting case of the quantum aspect, right? So, what's the force on an electron? So that's the first question we want to ask because. From a classic notion of classical mechanics, why would anything move at all, right? It, it, why would anything move at all, right? So, and then how, why would it move? Because there's a force acting on it. That's how we learn classical mechanics, right? And so, what is the force on any particle, for that matter? You know, not necessarily an electron. That, that's an easy question, right? So, what's the, how do you, what's the relation? Who gave us this law, and what is the law, right? Yeah. Yeah. Right. So force is mass uh, times the acceleration. So let's write it as uh, you know rate of ch uh, change of velocity or d d two x by d t squared. Uh, we are just going to write one d whenever we you know uh, don't need to you know it's it's understood that it's three dimensions. It could be three dimensions or something like that. Wherever we need the higher dimensional vectors, I'll put that in there, right? So right now, this is a vector, that's a vector, but it's in one dimension. Yeah. So force is mass times acceleration, uh, and that's clearly uh, you know, a Newtonian way of thinking about things, right? Uh, uh, this picture has undergone gone several refinements over the years. You know? uh, uh, so Hamilton came along, and so now there's a Hamiltonian way of looking at classical mechanics, where you write you know, the Hamiltonian, which is uh, energy kinetic plus potential, and you minimize it. It's called a, and then there's a Lagrangian way of looking at it. We'll talk about those things later when we talk about some aspects of Feynman path integral and all that. We don't want to get that going at this point. But essentially, 
it's important to realize that the force comes out of, I mean, it, it's not like it comes out of nowhere. The force is mass times acceleration is, can be derived. This can be derived from Hamiltonian principles, which is a principle of least action typically, you know. And that I think is very intuitive. If I roll a marble down an inclined slope, which path will it follow, right? If light goes from one point to another, which path does it follow, right? Why does it bend and all that, right? So those things are all related to what's called principle of least action. And uh, uh, action is a very, very physical quantity. It's uh, defined as, you know, kinetic minus potential energy. And we are going to talk about that later, you know. So you minimize it and you derive this law. It comes out from there, right? So, so that's the force on any particle that has mass. Uh, clearly, this law doesn't tell you how light would move, right? Uh, light has, photons have no mass, so it, 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 this law cannot describe how light might move, for example, right? But it can definitely describe how electrons might move. Uh, now, that being said, so that's your, you know, classical mechanics. Uh, this is obviously a very succinct you know, description of classical mechanics. But it is actually quite a bit, right? Uh, now, uh, the other thing I wanted to discuss is, is uh, electromagnetic theory, you know. Uh, and because electrons are not just, uh, you know, masses, they also have charge, right? They have charge as well. So if I did not know classical mechanics, I could still have found out, uh, you know, uh, how an electron might move if I knew electromagnetic theory. I could still find that out, right? And what is the law there? How would an electron move according to electromagnetic theory? So what forces does a particle have that has charge experience, right? Which a particle with no charge cannot experience, right? So that's the question that electromagnetic theory gives, uh, that gives you the answer to, right? So electromagnetic theory tells you that, uh, well, what would be the force on the electron if you have yeah. the Lorentz force, exactly right. So Lorentz force is a classical result. Uh, Lorentz force is that uh, if you have a charge Q, right, if you have a charge Q in Coulombs, then the total force on that particle is Q times the electric field, right, plus there's a magnetic component to it, which is the velocity of the particle cross product with the magnetic field, right? right. So that's your Emag, you know. So in, in other words, force is equal to that is electromagnetic theory, if you might. Right. And you can see that uh, the two must be equal. Uh, the two forces must be equal, right? Uh, so that will tell you what trajectory will the electron take in space if you have a specific electric field or a specific magnetic field imposed on it, right? So, uh, so I'm done with classical theory of electron transport. You know, this is it, right? Honestly, I mean, this is it, and everything else is you apply it and you solve it for various cases. You know, this is the classical theory of electromagnetic, uh, of, of quantum, tra uh, sorry, of transport of electrons. But of course, there's more, right? So, so let's just look at this a little bit more. So electric field uh, and uh, magnetic field are, are two components. Uh, if we, uh, are sitting on the charge and you're moving really fast with the electron, it may not be very clear what is what. You know, electric field may look like a little magnetic if you are moving at relativistic speeds, right? If you're moving very fast. If you're moving slowly, then these two might look very distinct, you know. Uh, we will talk about these things later because that's what gives birth to spin of an electron. You know, why does an electron have spin in the first place? You know? That's where it's a relativistic effect. It comes from relativity. The same physics as, you know, why is, you know, the Earth going around the sun, on our stars and all that. So it's the same physics, really, in angular momentum, but, but the, it's very similar physics. We'll talk about that later. But uh, uh, if the electrons are moving s relatively slowly, which is the realm of classical physics, uh, this is a very valid and a very accurate law. And, uh, but it is, after all, uh, uh, an approximation. So there are some things that are missing here, like there's a square in, in the denominator, there's a speed of light and all that stuff. We are, we, are, we are not considering that at this point. We'll bring it back when we need to, you know, look at spin and other things. So now electric and magnetic fields, how do we create electric and magnetic fields? Or how are they created? Where does electric field start from? 
where does it originate from? Right. So if you look at electromagnetic theory and say, oh, I have an electric field that's going like that, right? So what's sitting here? This charge, right? And typically it would be electrons or maybe protons or some other positive charge, or negative charge, right? So, so charge creates electric fields and charge also moves due to electric fields. So, so it's both, both ways, right? It creates it and moves as well. Charge will originate from, oh, sorry, electric fields will start out at positive charges and terminate on negative charges, right? So, so you can kind of almost draw the field lines, how they might look between the two. So. Okay. So, if I put two field, uh, you know, charges like that in free space and nothing else in the universe, what will happen? You know, ultimately. So, they will attract, right? Positive and negative charge will attract and they will lie on top of each other, you know, uh, and why does that happen? Why do they do that? You know? Why do they move? This is a, already a transport problem. Let's say I fix this charge somehow. What's going to happen to that is going to get attracted to it. Right? Why, why does it do that, by the way? It minimizes the energy. Exactly right. In fact, that's the answer to all questions in this course. Why does it do it? Because in the end, it is just trying to minimize its energy. Right? Minimize its energy and also you know, it, 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 it increases the entropy of it. You know, it, it increases, and we'll see that those will be the two driving forces minimization of energy and increase in entropy because they are related to each other okay so actually a more deeper question is why do unlike charges attract and like charges repel it's a more deeper question now. does anybody know why why do like charges repel and unlike charges attract obviously, obviously we have been told since we're born that this is true right and all experiments have proven that it is true. But why? Why does it happen? Right? <clears throat> That's a very difficult question to answer. So the, at least today, as far as I know, I mean, you need to have a full machinery of quantum field theory to understand why that happens. You know? And I don't have a simple explanation for it. Uh, it. The latest way of understanding this problem is, you know, a charge itself, be it, neg be it an electron, is, is a lump of, you know, concentrated, interacting electromagnetic fields so it's, it's, it's like that and then uh, if it's if it has a certain symmetry it is negative this charge is negative as the other symmetry its charge is positive and then why do like charges repel unlike charges attract the answer is again it's trying to minimize its energy you know it's these fields are interacting with each other they're entangled with each other and if fields have certain symmetries they would try to you know Come the particle, the origins would try to come together, or they'll repel. So that, that's, and we are not going to get into that too much, too deep into that as to why, unlike charges, would attract. But every device we make with charges is based on this concept that unlike, you know, like charges will repel and unlike charges will attract. And it's a very simple concept, but you know, a transistor, diode, laser, many of them really are based on this concept. So it's a very basic notion, right? Okay, so electric fields and magnetic fields. Uh, how do I create electric fields? I use charge, right? And uh, uh, so there's, uh, unlike one Newton's law here, there are four equations, which are the Maxwell's equation that tell you how, you know, all this stuff works out, electric and magnetic fields, how they work out, right? And that's, this is also a, kind of a very quick summary of things. Uh, so if I have a charge density rho, rho is in coulombs per volume, unit volume. So I'll say centimeter cube. This is an engineering you know, notation. It's can number of charges per unit volume, coulombs per centimeter cube. If I have a charge density rho, for example here, I put, instead of one positive charge, I put say three or four, five in a certain volume, and rho is the total charge divided by volume. Then uh, it creates uh, a diverging electric field from, from the origin, right, from, from the point where we are. And so it, it creates a divergence of an electric field. And uh, electric field uh, is, and if I multiply it by what's called the dielectric constant, and this is also dependent on, on matter. If you have, if it's inside a solid, it will be the dielectric constant of the solid. If you're in vacuum, it's just the permittivity of vacuum, 
So relative dielectric constant is zero. So this quantity is called the displacement vector, right? And this is, you know, class electromagnetic theory. Dielectric constant times electric field is displacement vector, and divergence of this displacement vector is equal to the charge. So that's that's you know essentially saying physically what it's saying is if I put some atoms on the way here with electron clouds, it has certain polarizability, so the epsilon is going to change. The electric field will be a little lower. You know, that's that's what it really says because these atoms will screen the field a little bit. You know, so, so the field uh, might be a little lower. So divergence of the displacement vector, which is really a proxy for the electric field, is equal to the charge. And I think you can see it's very physical. You know, the charge gives rise to a diverging field. So, so, and then that's what it is, right? Similarly, divergence of magnetic fields. You know, magnetic field is created classically, right, by a charge uh, that is moving in a wire. The wire itself is neutral. The wire is neutral, but there's negative charge which is a population of electrons in a metal wire for example that's moving the positive charges are staying put they are the nuclei they, they are not moving right? the electrons are moving and if it carries a current i then if i'm sitting outside here and i in, use some iron filings or a compass and look at which direction is the magnetic field pointing is going to wrap around the you know wrap around that wire right so so uh, that uh, uh, that 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 is you know and and magnetic field for example the distance r would be, uh, I think, you know, B or Savart law gives you all that sort of thing, 4 pi r or no, 4 pi r or something like that, or 2 pi r, something like that, right? So it goes as 1 over r as you go, go away from the charge. So anyway, that's the magnetic field. Uh, it wraps around these uh, areas. And uh, magnetic field lines have no beginning and no end. They close on themselves. They're loops, right? And, and uh, uh, therefore, uh, the divergence of magnetic field is zero. Uh, this is uh, classical uh, electromagnetic theory. Physically, it also means that there are no magnetic monopoles. There's no equivalent of a charge that's going to cause a divergence. Most people in advanced physics today believe that sooner or later people will discover magnetic monopoles. It just has not happened yet, you know, so um, because uh, by some laws, you know, symmetry laws and all, People think there should be magnetic monopoles, but again, n n no conclusive evidence yet. Uh, okay, now uh, the uh, other two, which are very important uh, uh, laws, uh, which we'll, you know, again, it's I'm just summarizing it as a, you know, for sake of completeness at this point. So, curl of electric field. An electric field can curl around, uh, uh, you know, uh, objects as long as there's a time-varying magnetic field rate of change of magnetic field you know, it goes by various names first uh, discovered by faraday so you know faraday law uh, lenz's law all those things are kind of similar really uh, and this is what causes you know generates electricity in dams and electric vehicles and all that uh, happen because of this law right so uh, you move a magnet in circles and you can generate current or something like that, right? So, so that's the idea, right? All electric machines make use of this. Uh, curl of electric field is rate of change of magnetic field and curl of, uh, uh, just like, you know, you have electric field and displacement related, you also have magnetic field uh, B is related to a material property which is permeability times uh, what's called a magnetization, H. Right? And so, I'm pretty sure, anybody not seen this? I just want to make sure. Uh, again, I mean, if you haven't seen it, that's fine. You should let me know, you know, anybody not? Okay, good. So, uh, but if you feel that, you know, uh, uh, you need some more uh, discussion, please come by to, you know, and discuss this with me. But curl of uh, magnetization will be equal to uh, what's called the conduction current b because of particles or electrons plus a displacement rate of change of displacement you know so that's that's your those four are you know the you know to some extent the most comprehensive set of laws ever discovered till now you know it's the maxwell's equations definitely more comprehensive than all you know quantum or strings and all that other things that we talk about today it's very complete it has beautiful symmetries in it and all laws that we physicists or you know people discover really uh, strive to be like this, you know. So this is com very beautiful and complete, right? Because it immediately predicts a lot of beautiful things right away. You can combine these two 
and what pops out from here? Uh, light, you know, light, the property that there should be light comes out by combining these two laws because you see there's a rate of change of magnetic field here, rate of change. So you can couple these two. And when you couple these two, you get that, uh, I'll just write it down, there's no need to try to derive it, uh, that del squared minus of electric field should be equal to zero. You know. So you get that, it's called the wave equation. Right? The wave equation, when you take this and plop it into that equation, this is what comes out, saying that if you, saying that an electric and magnetic field are related in a such, such a way that this is possible in an electromagnetic field. That's all it's saying. You know, the, if you have electric field that satisfies this law, it's an allowed electric field. You know, so th that's what it m means to say. And we'll see exact analogy th of this for electrons is a Schrodinger equation, you know, exact analogy of this. And then the Dirac equation and everything like that. It's the exact, you know, they are striving to be like this, right? So, so and then that's what controls, this equation controls the transport of photons, right? And the Schrodinger equation controls the transport of electrons. So, so it's, the, it's the quantum version of, 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 of classical. So this is for waves, uh, so it's called the wave equation. Uh, and it was really the uh, crowning glory, if, if you might, of Maxwell himself. Because people before Maxwell knew most of these things, even Gauss knew these things, uh, Frederick Gauss before him. Faraday knew the, this from experimental Ampere. This is called the Ampere's law. Ampere knew this. But Ampere didn't have the displacement vector. In it. So Maxwell introduces displacement, and by combining these, he says that you can get this. And uh, Faraday always believed he was a, really one of the greatest experimentalists to ever live. Uh, he always believed that light was an electromagnetic wave where E and B are mixed together. But he couldn't prove it mathematically. That was left for Maxwell to do. So, uh, so why is this uh, interesting? Because you know this is a wave equation. So it says that if I take del is a derivative in space, d by dx, right? d by dx, or you know if you're in 3D space, uh, uh, you know uh, this is a Laplacian x square, y square, you know, uh, double derivatives. So this is basically you're doing, you know, if you might, d2 by dx square, and you're doing d2 by dt squared, and you can see that. Whatever is sitting here must have the units of speed, right, of velocity. And if you take these two equations, the, this quantity c turns out to be 1 over square root of epsilon naught times mu naught, which are the you know, fundamental uh, permittivity of vacuum and the permeability of vacuum. And when you multiply those and do the ratio, you get 3 times you know, 10 to the power 8 meters per second. So essentially kind of showing that this is the equation for transport of photons of light. You know. Now if you, if you do some other experiment, not necessarily for photons, but uh, you know, some other particles uh, or, or so other waves, and you get some other velocity here, it's still the wave equation for that wave. Right? But the equation looks exactly the same. It's a core concept of all waves that you know, uh, the, uh, the transport of that wave will look something like this, you know, oscillating. So you are looking at how fast are things changing in space, d by dx squared. How fast are things changing in time, and they are related to each other by a fixed ratio. Right? So that's the meaning of the speed of a wave. Uh, and uh, uh, so this is the way, uh, you know, a wave equation for light. And uh, okay, so any questions here? I will, I will kind of uh, try to. Um, you know, move move to the uh, next step here, but uh, it will come back when we start to look at the equation for transport for for, uh, for electrons and ma masses as well. Right? It'll also be a wave equation. That's the Schrodinger wave equation. Okay. But this is completely classical. You know, how do you know something is classical? There's something missing here, and what is that? H or H bar, Planck's constant. So unless Planck's constant shows up, it's a good rule of thumb that it's a classical law. There are some where it actually still quantum, but you, can't, you know, there are a couple, but we are probably not going to encounter them. This is a completely classical uh, equation. And even today, I mean, it, it explains uh, uh, for uh, light with a reasonable large number intensity, uh, the motion of, you know, uh, of, of transport of light. 
if you go down to one photon, you will have trouble with this equation. No, it's just, uh, so so that the quantum aspect of it uh, will sh will require you to have h bar, and that's quantum electrodynamics. You know, that's uh, yeah. Okay. okay so uh, going back here, uh, so electric field uh, and magnetic field in this equation uh, are you can consider it. There are, two, there are two situations. One is electrostatics, when all charges are, yeah, sorry, uh, electrostatics. If I keep a charge fixed in space and in time, it's not moving anywhere. Then it will create a you know, well-known constant electric field. Right? If you have a wave going through, on the other hand, the electric field is oscillating. You know? Electric field is going as some constant times e to the power i kx minus omega t. It's oscillating. It's going up, zero, negative, zero, and so on. It's, it's, you know, the vector is going you know, up and down. And uh, it's oscillating in a way that the k, and the k and omega are related. For light, it's omega is c times k, frequency at which you know, the, right, the angular frequency and the linear frequency, if you might, I mean the wave, wavelength, 2 pi by wavelength, are related by the speed of light. Right? So uh, the electric field, in a, and that's called electrodynamic situation. Here you cannot have you cannot have static light. Light is always vibrating. It's oscillating in time and space. Right? That's the defining feature of light, actually. So I can't have a constant electric field because of light itself. You know, constant electric field. How would I make a magnetic field? Because once I know how to make them, how to create them, I can control the force on my particle, and I can make electrons move any way I want. Right? So, so that's the idea of you know, kind of a use, user perspective of, of, of uh, trying to make use of the classical laws of motion. So, uh, uh, so if I have, uh, for example, a particle that's, uh, you know, if I have an electron uh, that is subject to only an electric field, then force on that electron would be just mass times, uh, oh, sorry, the charge times, and that's interesting, I can't, uh, all right. So, force is charge times the electric field, right? And that is also the mass times the acceleration, right? Right. So that tells you that uh, uh, if I take a particle and I have a constant electric field, and I have that electron somewhere in there, and I track its motion, uh, then it should follow, you know, the uh, you know very simple law given by this uh, charge over mass ratio, right? Times the electric field. Uh, okay. So, right both charge and mass will play a role in how fast that electron is moving, right? Now, if the electron is moving in free space, then it will keep accelerating. Its velocity will keep increasing, right? Because this is a constant. Electric field is a constant. If I have you know, a very large area, it's, it's going to keep increasing. But you know it won't increase forever, right? What's, what's kind of a limit? There are many limits to it, but what's the upper limit? You know? Speed of light. It cannot go faster than the speed of light, right? Because uh, as it starts moving faster and faster, uh, it's going to. So these laws of motion don't account for you know relativity yet. Right? So it's going to actually radiate energy. You know, it's going to become. Uh, so as you accelerate an electron close to speed of light, it it loses energy. You know, it, if you go speed of light, it will completely become light. You know? so. so so, and that's what we do. For example, the synchrotron facility here in campus, where you know under the football, uh, the stadium, uh, they, have, they take electrons and they accelerate it to 0 0.999 times the speed of light, and because of that, it radiates all these you know waves, and you can, did, you know, pull out a little bit of waves here and do spectroscopy with it. It radiates a lot of you know X-rays, all kinds of very high intensity X-rays. So you can see that this law is not complete. There are things missing here. Uh, typically, what's missing is you know one over this relativistic term. But for low speeds, this is a good law. This is a, low, this is a good law. Meaning, low speeds, I would say, about a hundred times slower or three hundred times slower than the speed of light. That's how fast the fastest electrons move inside solids. You know? About hundred to three hundred times slower than the speed of light. You know, that's uh, that's uh, that's the fastest. I mean, it typically moves much slower than that. But uh, okay, so. So this you can write it as the you know rate of change of the velocity of electrons, right? That's just that. And if it was unimpeded, if there was nothing to stop the electron, it would accelerate. Uh, but in in as we will learn, 
if we put an electron inside a solid, there are a lot of things it can collide with. There are defects, all these other things, right? So what will happen then is uh, every now and then it is going to scatter and lose its velocity, and we are going to get to that in the next class now. I'm just going to motivate it. You know, it's like a viscous drag. If you have a parachute, you know, dropping, you know, somebody opens a parachute, right? Initially they accelerate because of gravity, but because of friction, they reach a terminal velocity, right? Right? It initially actually is determined. And that's a viscous drag. So if you put an electron and you, there are all these objects with which it can scatter as it's moving along. So every tau seconds or so, it will scatter and randomize its velocity. It's going this way, it will go that way. So this is a new law of motion which has damping or viscous drag. Right? So the moment I take that uh, and you solve it in steady state, steady state means nothing is changing with time you get that the velocity will be equal to Q tau over mass times an electric field and there's a minus sign, you know, that's a steady state velocity in, this, in the presence of scattering, in the presence of viscous drag. Right? And this quantity, velocity, is, becomes proportional to electric field and what's sitting in front is called the mobility of the electron in that material. Semiconductor, in silicon for example, mobility would be a few hundred centimeters square per volt second and things like that, right? So, so, so but velocity becomes proportional to electric field. And, uh, all right, I think we are, we are, we are uh, done with the, uh, is that right? <laughs> all right, yeah. So uh, I'll leave it here. Uh, so it's still in the classical form. Um, and I'll give you, uh, an, in first assignment, I'll have a problem where you will solve uh, a couple of, interesting problems of transport of in classical mechanics. And uh, let me just say that very interestingly, if you have an electromagnetic wave going through, you know, el oscillating electric and an oscillating magnetic field, and there's electron sitting there, that problem today remains unsolved in classical mechanics. People can't solve it. It's, it's not that easy, you know. But we are going to look at a few easy things. Uh, uh, but I'm just uh, trying to tell you that even in classical mechanics, some of these concepts are uh, non-trivial, you know, and, and, and they are um, pretty fascinating in that sense. I mean, there are a lot of other things that come about from there. Okay, good. So we meet on Thursday. And